Great. Great, good. Nice to see some folks. Thank you. Mike, are you back? If you're I am in, back. He is back. back. All right. So yeah, thanks. Uh, okay. <laughs> just, just checking. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> That's the, the danger of, of recording stuff is sometimes folks say, oh, I'll get the recording. I understand. It's it's evening in the UK. And hi, I'm MC Schrafel. Got to watch my hands that they don't disappear. Um, and I'm here with Mike Jones from Brigham Young, and we're going to be talking to you today about some discomfortable stuff, um, but also some fun stuff. And that's the path that I hope you can see from this groovy new way of presenting slides that Teams has that Josh, uh, who presented earlier this week for part one, uh, shared with us. So just to set the context, is we'll go over a little bit of what um, Josh presented in the last talk, which is an overview of the in 5 c for what that is, introduce you to the concept of how we use those for, for thinking about design, which is what we call tuning. And then uh, Mike is going to give an example of some of, the, uh, of a material that we might use for tuning, which is discomfort, and that's role in embracing discomfort for design. And then I'm going to come back in and finish up with a little bit talking about some other what we frame as continua or areas in a design intervention where we can start to use um, the N5 and C4 to, in a deliberately constructed design space. So that the things you should have by the end of this talk that you don't have now are some new tools and approaches to thinking about how you might want to design to support a particular kind of human practice for health and, and well-being. Okay, so um, I'm not sure actually how to advance the slides in this, if it's the same, because I've had some groovy animations and I bet they all collapsed, but we'll see. Anyway, um, one of the key points that Josh started with uh, the other day was to say that the embodied interaction takes the body as the site of adaptation. And in fact, we can press on adaptation a little bit further to note that adaptation is always happening exactly in response to what it is being um, stressed with or, or pushed in, or even if it's a good thing, like a warm environment, you might feel more relaxed or a cold environment, you might shiver. Um, different, we are always responding exactly to the demands of the context that we're in whether we like it or not. And this is the thing is that we're going to talk too about feeling is that sometimes we just don't perceive that our body is perceiving a potential threat or responding to low grade inflammation or some happier, more positively uh, associated uh, impression. So the question though to ask within this, if we accept this body as a site of adaptation is um, why should we care? So, Anybody want to have a go at from, from our, our house tonight of a why uh, this orientation is helpful or useful for design to say, well, the body's the site of adaptation. A any thinking that you've done to say, that makes sense. Why might that be useful for interaction designers? You don't have to be right, but just, you know, what do you think? MC, maybe I'll throw something in to get the conversation started. I think I look at it from a um, almost an engineering perspective. So I, that's kind of my background is building things. And uh, if you're going to build a system that a person uses, understanding the body and how it adapts and responds to things is like half of the equation. And uh, unpacking that equation, I think, leads to to better design, design that better supports people um, accomplishing whatever it is they're trying to accomplish and, frankly, living a better life. So anyway, I see it as very much uh, opening the black box and understanding that what I engage a person with in a system I build will cause adaptations in them and thinking about what that means and 
in healthy ways. Anyway, that's a thought. That's, that's cool. Anybody want to add anything to that? I think I appreciate that, Mike. I think that's uh, bang on uh, as a great starting point. Any other riffs on that so far? If something suddenly occurs, jump in. And uh, we could get into how that works in terms of um, adaptation as a process for homeostasis and metabolism. We're not going to in this talk, but if you're interested, there is some talk stuff in the primer right now that you can look at for that metabolism adaptation homeostasis interaction about how it works. But to come back to what um, Mike was just talking about is understanding what it, how does adaptation work is that we're constantly adapting to it. If you think about interaction as engineering systems for better health, understanding what we're doing with our designs to affect an adaptation, what adaptation does it facilitate more than another is really important um, because how we align our design, we talk about align the design, you know, what kind of alliteration or rhyming can we get? But how we align the design will affect adaptation. Uh, and what we can see is also what the normal uh, or status quo of our daily life uh, designs are, is that they are wired to create really not very positive um, adaptations. And so, sorry, I jumped ahead a bit. So what we can start to ask ourselves is, okay, we know the body is the site of adaptation. We can prove that outside of a design context in terms of our physiology. We are talking about the N5 and the C4 last week. And just to review what the N5 and the C4 are, is that the embodied five are the five semi-volitional fundamental ways in which we um, have some say over what is essential for us to live, have quality of life. Um, and that if we don't do them, uh, there are painful results. Another way that I've defended these is that their withdrawal is used as torture. So you must know that they're pretty important and pretty effective uh, when you don't withdraw them. So for instance, we have move, engage, eat, cogitate, and sleep. And these are the five things that we are wired physiologically to um, use to require. So and what I mean by semi-volitional is that we all have to move or that we're all moving. Our bodies are moving all the time in one way or another. And we are having to eat at different times. How we do that, though, we have some choice over the amounts, uh, the, the when, um, and the what and, and with whom even that or whether we're walking on the go while we're eating or sitting. So we have all these choices in terms of how we do these, but we have to do them. The C4, the circumbodied four we talk about is this is what surrounds us and it informs the fact that we need those five things. So the reason we have the muscles and the skeletal structure that we do is because we're evolving against gravity. The reason that our um, gut and our skin, for instance, work in the way that they do to connect the body and the brain together are because of the microbiome and the way that's evolved to mediate and facilitate certain internal processes. Uh, vitamin K is not in small part developed in the gut by the state of our microbiota. And if you want to find out something funky about how important vitamin K2 is, just look up vitamin K2 as an example. So I won't go deeper into that. We can review last time's talk, but it's these two sets of um, components that be can become, the reason I'm going over this again in such detail, is that they become the locus at which we can consider any design intervention that we wish to make is going to only be possible by engaging um, these two sets of, of variables. So that's important, but how, how do we interact with it? How do we use that in a design space? That's sort of the, the meat and potatoes of what we're gonna be doing in this talk. So to move into the new component is how do we engage with the N5 and the C4? And that's by what we call tuning. And this is something that Eric Heckler and I uh, working on for a while and framed in, the, in these ways. And he talks about tuning as well as resonance. And you'll also see the note here of adaptivity and context. How do we achieve adaptivity and context? And the reason uh, for using the metaphor of tuning is that we have a lot of ways of talking about tuning and resonance is that 
tuning, we can tune to something. So if you think about an instrument, uh, like a stringed instrument and guitar that goes out of tune a lot, mechanical thing, uh, is that we have a, a reference frequency. The tuning fork metal, uh, the way it's constructed, doesn't go out of tune, or we use an electronic device that can create a particular frequency, fantastic, and that we can align what we're experiencing with that, or the, the instrument can be aligned to that um, pitch, the frequency. So they res literally do resonate harmonically together, fantastic. We can also tune within ourselves. So uh, a guitar, again, is an example that doesn't have a pitchfork to tune to, can tune its strings. Maybe you could mute yourself there, Fatima. You took off your speaker there. Thank you, that's just, it's the echo. It's not that I don't want to hear you. Um, so the instrument can tune to itself, relative to itself, without reference to an external pitch. And you can imagine the metaphors there if something has tuned entirely to itself, but is constantly banging against its, its context. So you can imagine um, the example to use more instruments is that uh, these instruments might have all tuned to what's referred to as concert pitch 440 uh, for the A tone in the orchestra, but somebody comes in with a slightly different tuning, they might play the same pieces perfectly, but when they're not in resonance together, we're not tuned to that fundamental frequency together, then uh, it sounds terrible, even though it's all correct. I think that's awesome as a metaphor for design is, is when we're working together doing the right things exactly, but somehow it's just not meshing. What's going on there? Of course, is the analogy of, of an engine also being in tune in terms of, of it. The result of an engine being in tune is that it can create more power with less effort. Uh, and, and that's important. So the, the less effortful an action is, the better. And when we think about aligning our design, that's one of our kind of uh, assessments is, are we helping somebody achieve um, well-being, great, their great performance, their aspirations as efficiently as possible with as little effort in execution as possible. That might sound like a contradiction if we're talking about discomfort momentarily and the important role of discomfort, but it's all about when and how, those semi-volitional things that we can control. So if we look at, uh, again, just to get into what does tuning mean in embodied interaction, there are three parts, and I'd like to go over these a little bit because uh, folks have, have scratched their heads with me while we've been doing this. And let's say that that anything we adapt to, we call it this middle piece here, some experience that's gonna trigger an adaptation. And it doesn't matter whether it's a cold shower in the morning when you suddenly run out of hot water, or it's a sunburn, or it's reading a good book. That's, some, that's the experience part. And, it will have an internal response in terms of that adaptation that's part of that uh, metabolic homeostatic adaptive interchange that happens. So something's going on, and, and in the spring term, when we come back to this, we're going to be talking a little bit more about interoception uh, as, as a framing for understanding how to talk about these internal feelings. Uh, and that internal feeling we might not be that aware of. So we talk about perceived feeling in parentheses. We're gonna come back to this. So hang on to that Is it uh, with examples. And so based on that feeling, we then can think about, well, I don't like how I feel and you want to do something else. Well, what else can you do effectively to feel better depends on what you know how to do. So we call it KSP, knowledge, skills, and practice. So the KSP that we are able to access will affect what that relationship is between perceived feeling and this experience that triggers an adaptation. Where am I going with this? Well, the kinds of questions that we want to ask within this space about um, bringing in knowledge, skills, and practice to help tune the experience so that you can literally feel better are questions like, how do you feel how you feel. Uh, this this isn't just a pun on words, let me unpack that. You could say, do you know how to feel how you feel better? So if you're feeling um, stressed or cruddy or just kind of bleh inside right now, do you know really 
um, a couple of things that might actually help you feel better. Uh, and, it, and we might feel, this is when we might feel we go to what we know if we're feeling crappy. It might be, I'm going to eat a whole lot of ice cream right now. For me, it would be many slices of bread with butter on them would be just killer often. And yet there's some other knowledge I have that that way problems lie. It is uh, happiness for a moment and then it's a whole lot of pain for many different reasons afterwards. So it's it's a quick fix, but it's not a fix. So that's based also on practice and listening to that. Do we know how to feel better? Do you know what feeling better feels like is probably one of the most important but underlooked questions in the tuning space is if we're working with folks, and this is often why people resist um, when you tell them, oh, this is good for you. You got to go exercise. It's like, uh, why? I, I think I feel okay. I don't, I don't need to do that. They don't know what feeling better from exercise feels like, but they know that it's uncomfortable and they don't like it. So why should they do it? They don't know the payoff. So if we move from that, we can start to think about why is that blocking happening? Why is that perceived feeling so uh, range so terrible? And I would, I would postulate that it doesn't have very good KSP, not very good knowledge, skills, and practice to draw on, but it draws on habit of what normal cultures have said, this is your technology solution. So most of us have the experience of setting an alarm to wake up in the morning. And even though it makes us feel like crap, and we're we're stunned for that part of the day. It's well, this this is the technology we use, or we use the so-called smart alarm, which I will come back to momentarily. It's the right thing to do. Everybody does it. And yet, by doing this again, what happens? We wake up underslept, we go through our day feeling fatigued, and we don't necessarily um, challenge the actual practice that is making us feel this way because we've accepted that this is just the way things are. And yet it's this very embodiment of an interaction design, which is the alarm clock itself, which is the problem. There is no such thing as a smart alarm because if the goal, if the alignment of the design is you need to get enough sleep such that you wake up when you wake up, that's all we need to do as human beings. If we are asked to wake up artificially before the sleep pressure has released itself and we wake up normally, if we need if we need an alarm to wake up in time for something, we're underslept. That's what that means. That's all that that uh, technology tells us. That is my favorite example lately of a technology that is not aligned, that is completely unaligned with our designed. And so again, just to touch on where tuning comes into this, is that we can look at this cyclically, and these pieces move around, is that we have, tuning is about having an experience, having a perceived feeling in this case from that experience, and knowing how to either mitigate or amplify or correct or enhance that experience based on knowledge that we've gained from some source uh, skills that we have developed and the regular practice of that knowledge and skill set. And why practice is so important, again, I, I, I touched on it with the ice cream example, is when we're under uh, demand, not necessarily stress, but under any kind of demand, we go to what we've practiced as our default. And so if what we've practiced is stress equals ice cream or stress equals French bread till you just can't move anymore, then that's what that's what you'll do, even though um, the effects are, you know what the effects are, unless you've tested something else in that circumstance, you don't go to it. So having KSP to address a situation, important. Another way of framing this, though, is that the starting point might not be uh, just the experience. It might be, I have some knowledge, skills, and practice that are creating a new experience that I'm liking, this new feeling that we have, and that is creating a new range of perceived feelings. If I'm suddenly able to get more sleep and wake up on my own and I feel great, 
Now I have a new perceived range about what well slept can feel like and also some experience about how to get that. This might feel like I'm stating the obvious moving around this circle, but I think it's important to show that these cycles can start at any point, but they relate to each other consistently. So I'm just going to go walk through one example and then pass it over to Mike to talk about discomfort. So if <laughs> this is probably one of the most overloaded slides I've ever done. But if we start over here on the left-hand side talking about an experience, here's an experience that I've dealt with a lot of folks with chronic pain issues is that they are having a crappy experience at work. They say, I've got chronic back pain. Somebody might come in and adjust their desk for them through screen, but they still have the chronic pain. This is their perceived feeling. This is the dominant feeling. And when perceived feelings can get quite loud, that means that there's not room for other things because um, at this point when you get a pain response, a chronic pain as sort of um, not a, a sharp pain that you can point to right there. It hurts right here. It's sort of in a generalized area and it, it makes it uh, difficult to move freely or you just, you're not even moving and, and you're in this state that is really restrictive. So that's happening. What can you do about it? Well, like I say, somebody might have adjusted your desk, but you're fed up with that. You're frustrated. And you do some research. You start to explore and gain some knowledge, like this paper down here, on, oh, look, kettlebells and, and chronic pain seem to do something. There's something going on there. You learn about what the heck is a kettlebell? How does that work? You might get some videos or some coaching to actually try that. This now KSP, knowledge, skills, and practice, actually becomes a new experience. You start to feel things. And the adaptation is not only that your pain might go down, but your body might change. And look, you might actually have a new experience, <laughs> perceived feeling, where you feel better, which opens up the possibility for you to have yet another different in five experience here, the non-movement or movement. Now we're exploring engaging with others more than we might have before because we feel better about ourselves, better about our movement. But that still might trigger a little bit of stress because it's not a familiar place. And you go through the same thing. It's like last time I got some knowledge, skills, and practice, and all of a sudden I was able to do some cool stuff. This might call for some new knowledge, skills, and practice to be supported. Another design opportunity here, which can enliven you then to seek out new uh, solutions, new experiences, again, to find, in this case, an adaptation uh, supporting design alignment, like, uh, who knows, a, a standing desk with a treadmill that completely revises this experience where you started again. So it's all about finding ways progressively to tune in uh, what's important in terms of the aspiration or the adaptation you seek, which might be to be moving pain-free, you improve on that in five, that movement, it opens up the possibility to connect with other in five, which build confidence and, and then all of a sudden your universe is a happy place. So, um, oh, but speaking of desks, this, <laughs> this is why sometimes we have to go radical because here's like, the, my analogy here is here, here's the crappy desk scenario. This is our normal right now, which is the um, sort of sedentary office and here's ergonomics or human factors coming in, you know, saying sit up straight, get your desk adjusted. To me, that's like, oh, you're, you're doing crack. We'll make sure you use a clean needle. You're still going to be killing yourself, but you might not have as much pain while it's happening. There's no such thing like a, a good alarm. There's no such thing as eight hours of sedentary practice nonstop, no matter how you're sitting at your desk. So. Uh, again, that's that's just to kind of put that in context. What have we got so far? I promise Mike's coming almost momentarily. Is that I just want to review is that what you've got now that you didn't have before is this concept of tuning. And tuning is this three-part cycle of having an experience that kicks off a perceived feeling or an experience based on new knowledge, skills, and practice that gets to a perceived feeling where we use the N5 and C4 as our site of adaptation, of how we want to focus where the adaptation is. You focus on any of the N5 or the C4, you get all the others coming in eventually. Uh, and so the, this is asking, well, what is the material of tuning besides these guys, or how, can, how do we activate these different dimensions? And so now we're gonna talk about, to quote Laurie Anderson, uh, sit, sit right up in that straight back chair and get ready for some difficult and in this case discomfortable listening 
with Mike Jones. Do you want me to drive this for you, Mike? Uh, yeah, hey, thanks, MC. So let me see if I can drive it. So I think, so okay. I'm gonna click. Yep, I'm good. Okay. So yeah, I'll drive it, I'll be great. Yeah, thanks, MC, really enjoyed that. Um, let's, uh, let's dive right into discomfort as a design material. So, um, and by the way, I'm watching chat. So if you have a question as we go, uh, ask it there. Happy to answer questions as we go. So, um, first thing I want to talk about is uh, what is discomfort? So, you can think of, well, bigger picture, we're going to think here of discomfort as a material to incorporate into the design of interactive systems. And before we get too far down that road, we need to be clear about what we mean by the word discomfort. So um, from an operational perspective or what discomfort does, discomfort signals adaptation. So if I'm experiencing discomfort, um, there's an adapt that's signaling to me that there's an adaptation going on. And so to borrow from MC's example from a second ago, if I'm sitting uh, at a desk like the person on the left there and uh, I might be feeling discomfort in my lower back and that's signaling an adaptation that's happening in my lower back. So it could be that my muscles become stiff. It could be that the discs between my the bones in my spine are starting to separate from the spine. It could be all kinds of things happening in my back and forgive the anatomy for a second there. Um, but the, the idea, though, is that the discomfort is signaling an adaptation that's happening. And the key point here is that, that that adaptation is neither good nor bad. It just is. So discomfort signals adaptation. Whether that ad adaptation is a good or a bad thing is, is, is a separate question. So the alignment between the adaptation and a person's aspiration is the difference between good and bad discomfort. And I put those in quotes because those are big, vague, generic terms, but I think they'll do for this conversation. So in the top row there, um, the discomfort is sitting in a chair poorly at a desk. That signals that an adaptation is happening. And that adaptation is going to be uh, things like soreness and stiffness and damage that result in um, reduced functionality of the lower back. So most people don't want to have a sore back or destroy their back or cause unhealthy back conditions. So in that case, this is a bad adaptation because it's not aligned with the person's aspiration. The person working at a desk isn't there so that they can get lower back pain. They're, you know, that's that's not their goal. So the one on the bottom is a, uh, a simple example of positive or good discomfort. So uh, imagine a competitive swimmer experiencing discomfort during swim training. So this comes in various forms. Um, uh, learning how to uh, how to breathe correctly, learning all the motions, developing the muscles. Um, you know, the, the urge to breathe is a signal that the body is adapting to uh, not being able to breathe whenever it wants. The way that it processes oxygen may change. Um, soreness in muscles, discomfort in muscles uh, tells you that the muscle is adapting to the load that's being imposed. And if this is a competitive swimmer undergoing swim training, then the discomfort they're feeling is very much aligned with an aspiration that they have to go faster in the pool at their next swim meet. So we would call that a good discomfort. So the difference between good and bad discomfort is the aspiration of the person who's experiencing it. The, um, there's different forms or different things that trigger discomfort and it varies by person. So uh, in that top row of pictures, I've shown the swimmer that we saw, the picture of the swimmer that we saw before. Um, so for this particular person, swimming 500 meters in a pool is not all that uncomfortable. There's not a lot of discomfort associated with that. With other people, there would be significant discomfort associated with that. And so, um, the picture to the right there shows that same swimmer but competing in a triathlon so in that image she's out of the pool and she's running to a transition area where she's going to jump on a bike and for her there's a lot of discomfort associated with that because it's outside of her background and so 
the discomfort there is letting is signaling that her body's adapting to the load of running, of thinking about what's got to happen next. So in the pool, very comfortable that other people would find uncomfortable and uh, in this transition feeling discomfort again. So there's other forms of discomfort that aren't physical. So uh, it's easy to think about discomfort in the context of exercise. So that's why I started there. But we can also think of discomfort in the context of um, ideology or in terms of ideas or cognitive discomfort. So in the United States, those two images are the sort of icons of the two major political parties. And so the elephant corresponds to the Republican Party, which tends to be more conservative. The donkey corresponds to the Democratic Party, which tends to be more liberal and progressive. And so people from one party may experience discomfort when confronting the ideas of, an, of the other party, even if they're confronting them on paper. And uh, so that's a, a discomfort related to, to thinking and to ideas. The final one there shows a different kind of discomfort, which is a discomfort that people might feel in a social situation. So if you've attended a research conference, there's typically a coffee break at some point. And for some people that triggers a significant amount of discomfort, thinking of walking into a room with a bunch of people and striking up conversations. So there's physical discomfort, cognitive discomfort, and then uh, social discomfort is shown there. And that's not meant to be an exhaustive list. That's just different forms of discomfort and they change with different people. So I hope that gives you an idea of what we mean by discomfort. It's a signal that adaptation is happening. Uh, it's either good or bad, depending on how it aligns with aspiration and there's different forms. So at this point, you might be thinking to yourself, well, what about pain? So how, how, how are we thinking about pain and discomfort next to each other? So the swimmer in swim training may say that she's feeling pain. What, is, what does that exactly mean? So, um, or she may, she may not say that she's feeling discomfort. So what about pain? So by definition, in the discomfort design framework, and that means that we're taking this as an axiom. We're not justifying this based on clinical studies. We're not appealing to authority. We're stating that in the context of discomfort design, this is how we define the difference between discomfort and pain. And that's in the top of this slide here. So discomfort signals that the adaptation is increasing capacity. So discomfort is associated with an increase in capacity. Pain is an adaptation that's resulting in a decrease in capacity. So uh, if I'm a swimmer training for my next competition and I feel discomfort, well, that's a good thing. That means I'm increasing my capacity to compete. However, at some point that may cross over into pain and may be an indication that I've just injured my shoulder and I'm going to need uh, to stop training for a while and get some help. Um, repairing some soft tissue damage in my shoulder, which decreases my capacity to swim and compete. So again, that's by definition. We've looked at uh, clinical definitions of the distinction between pain and discomfort and the definitions of both, and they don't seem especially useful for discomfort design. So I've shown there the definition of pain from the International Association for the Study of Pain, and pain is an unpleasant, unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling things associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So in that definition, it's the tissue damage that's, um, that's sort of a defining characteristic of pain. However, um, in training the body, uh, especially imposed loads on muscles through weightlifting or swimming training or running or whatever, like tissue damage is being caused and it's as that damage is repaired is when capacity increases. So this definition of pain doesn't align well with what we mean by discomfort and pain. Uh, there's a paper on the differentiation between pain and discomfort in a nursing journal, Pain Management Nursing. Uh, and it, uh, it, it makes a distinction that pain can cause discomfort, but discomfort, not every discomfort is associated with pain. So their definition of pain is closer to tissue damage, like there's an actual underlying physiological condition and with discomfort there may or may not be. And we didn't find that definition very helpful either. So discomfort increases capacity, pain decreases capacity. 
So uh, just to be a little more clear about what I mean by that, uh, this is an example of some advertising for a marathon, and these are in miles. So if, if you live in kilometers, just sort of make the translation as best you can. So uh, a marathon is 26.2 miles, half marathon 13.1, and then of course it's a 10K, so 16.2. So in this particular marathon, they advertise it as, uh, and I've shown this in the top right, 26.2 miles of the pain you enjoy. So in the distinction I'm making between pain and discomfort, I would, uh, I would rewrite that as 26.2 miles of the discomfort you enjoy. Because if, if, if it's pain that you enjoy, pain is decreasing capacity every time. And so we wouldn't want to say that we're experiencing pain unless we are decreasing capacity. But... Um, we would want to think of that as discomfort rather than pain. Okay, um, so that's an overview of discomfort, what it is, how it contrasts with pain. And uh, what I wanna do next is switch over to uh, the design, switch over to design. So we're thinking now specifically about good discomfort, discomfort that's aligned with goals and aspirations. And I have two questions here at the bottom of the slide. So the first one is an introspective question. So as you think about the systems you use, how do they support discomfort that signals adaptation, which is supporting your aspirations? So if you think about the, the cycle that MC just showed us, how are the interactive systems that you use supporting your productive trips around that cycle? Um, I would propose that most of the interactive systems that I'm using aren't supporting my aspirations. So um, think about social media, how it's designed. It's designed to bring a person in, keep them engaged so that they can view ads so that the social media company can be paid for those ads. That's a slightly cynical view, but um, I'll be happy to talk about it more if you'd like. Now there's value there, otherwise people wouldn't use it in the first place. but think about the systems we use and are they are they supporting discomfort that's helping us reach our aspirations so using facebook for four hours on my phone might involve scrolling like this which might cause some discomfort in my thumb which is signaling that something's going on probably like a form of tendon inflammation but is that supporting my aspirations right is this discomfort in my thumb supporting an aspiration to have a sore thumb well no right so the next question, though, is the one that opens up a lot of possibilities and I hope a lot of creative and productive thinking. So to what extent, extent do the systems you create support discomfort that signals adaptation, which supports other people's aspirations? So if I'm creating or designing, a, designing something that's intended to be used by somebody else, how am I supporting them engaging with discomfort in a way that supports their aspirations? I think that's an important question to ask in the design of systems. And um, I call that discomfort design. So how am I designing for discomfort? And uh, I hope that raises some questions in your own mind. And we will, um, what I'd like to do next is give you a framework for thinking about discomfort design and then uh, close with uh, discomfort as a material. Uh, in design. So this is a six part framework for discomfort design and I'm going to use running as a running example and sorry for the bad pun there, uh, completely unintentional, but we'll use running as a running example to talk about this framework. So in design, um, I might think about three things before the person experiences discomfort, uh, something during their discomfortable experience, and then a couple things after. And all along this, um, well, let's start with the purpose over on the left. So in helping in discomfort design, I would want to think about connecting a person with their purpose for experiencing discomfort. I may need to help them identify their purpose for experiencing discomfort. And I need to connect them with an aspiration that they have. And this varies across people or time. So to go back to MC's example for a minute ago, part of this is helping people know that life can be better, right? Like they can, it's possible to feel better than you are now. And the purpose of dragging you through the discomfort that this system's gonna help you with is, is to make life better. And in the beginning, it's important to connect 
um, connect a person with a purpose. So in running, uh, different people have different purposes for running. Uh, some people run simply to stay healthy into old age. Uh, some people run because they're competitive and they want to go faster than everybody else, um, or at least a group of people. So in thinking about the purpose, it's important to know that it varies across people and even across time. Also beforehand, we want to help a person prepare for discomfort. So planning, understanding what they're going to feel, comes back to MC's question from before, do you know how to feel what you're feeling? And in the preparation phase, we might want to help a person know what to look for or what to feel for as they experience discomfort to know if they're getting the right dose, if you will, of discomfort. And then knowing when to stop and when to keep going. So the line between discomfort and pain can be thin. And it's important to help a person know if they can push farther or deeper into discomfort or if they should back off because they're about to cross over into pain. Remember, pain always decreases functionality, so we want to avoid that. Finally, the target. Where in the body or the worldview is this thing going to happen? Is it going to be physical discomfort, social discomfort, cognitive discomfort? And then helping a person learn how to determine if the discomfort is on target. During a discomfortable experience, we want to help them reconnect to their purpose. We want to help them push to the threshold between pain and discomfort. Uh, without going over and without coming up short either. And finally, there's two important things to think about after. One is helping a person see the payoff and pointing that out as soon as possible and reconnecting to the purpose so that there's motivation and intent to continue to go around this cycle and develop new knowledge, skills, and practice and a better, um, better more wellness in life. And finally, uh, afterwards, it's also important to help a person go through a recovery phase and that's necessary to give time for the adaptation to happen and it's important to help a person know the duration. So in the context of running, we connect them with their purpose, help them identify a purpose. Route planning would go into preparation, um, helping a person know if they feel a certain kind of sensation in their body that they should stop. So for example, a sharp pain in the outside of the knee might be a good signal to stop. And then also, um, helping them know that the, if the discomfort's on target, helping them feel their breathing pattern, helping them learn to feel how much exertion their body's putting out. During the discomfort, we're reconnecting them to why they run, helping them push to their threshold, but then again, trying to help them avoid pain. And afterwards, connecting them to increased fitness, uh, wellness feelings, um, uh, feelings of positive emotional states like uh, feeling happy, feeling a runner's high, feeling positive afterwards, and then helping them plan how long they need to stop running till they run again to avoid injury uh, and pain. And ideally, the person comes up at, through this with increased capacity and a new, uh, new self-image so that they can continue to uh, progress in their development of, of fitness and wellness. Maybe eventually that grows outside of running to include diet and sleep and other things that impact uh, running. OK, so another way to look at discomfort design is that it's interactive systems that act as a guide during a discomfort experience. So over here on the left is the present reality of a person. There in the middle is a mountain situation. I don't know if it's a mountain range, but a, a mountainous scene. And then on the other side of discomfort is some aspiration, some goal, some way that life is better. And so one way to look and the one way to look at discomfort design is that we are designing things that guide a person through that discomfort in the middle, helps them navigate it safely, helps them remember why they're navigating it and helps them choose a good path. And I've drawn this as if it's a single journey through that landscape. Actually, if you think about the cycle model that MC just drew out, probably the person's going to go through this landscape over and over again and learn it well and know how to travel it and then be able to do increasingly uh, challenging routes or increasingly rewarding routes. So it's not just a single trip through this discomfort landscape. It's, it's multiple trips that vary with time. So if you've spent a lot of time in a park or in a forest near your home, you probably came to learn and understand that better each time through and discomfort can be like that as well. Okay, last concept, and then I'll give it back to MC. So if we think of discomfort as a design material, 
materials have dimensions. So if I was going to buy a sheet of aluminum, I would want to know the way, the, the, the width, the height, the thickness, things like that. So there's dimensions to materials. So um, here's a, uh, a model of dimensions of discomfort as a material. So as I think about designing for discomfort, I want to think about the skill level of the person that I'm designing for. Are they a low skill level or a high skill level? And that will change how I think about it. I want to think about the duration of their engagement with discomfort. Are they going to experience the discomfort for weeks or are they going to experience it for a period of a few minutes? Um, coming back to running, uh, some people have never run at all. And so I would help them engage with discomfort differently and other people uh, are world class marathon runners and I would want to engage with them differently. Uh, some people will run the discomfort associated with running will last for 20 minutes because that's how long it needs to last in a particular session. For other people, the discomfort may last for a period of several days if it's an ultra marathon running situation. And then the skill level is this person have. Oh, I got sorry. I didn't mean to have skill level on there twice. Um, hold on. Let me look at my notes for a second and grab what I meant to have there and MC. I'll send you maybe a corrected version of this slide. Uh, that was a bit of a mistake on my part. Uh, the other thing to add here is spontaneity. So um, is there going to be low spontaneity for this discomfort? That is, I'm going to walk around the corner and run into somebody that makes me dis and have an experience that's discomfortable with no time to prepare. Or is this an assignment to give a presentation at a seminar and I'm going to have a lot of time beforehand before I feel discomfortable to think about the situation. So spontaneity would be another uh, dimension to look at. And finally, I just listed two at the bottom here. Frequency, how frequently am I going to feel discomfort? Is this something that's going to happen once an hour, once a lifetime, once a year, once a month? And then um, am I going to use the system during the discomfort a lot, a little bit, not at all. Um, so those are dimensions to think about. So to wrap up, um, the important thing here is that discomfort signals that adaptation is happening. And if that adaptation aligns with an aspiration, then we call that good discomfort and we want to help people engage with good discomfort. So as we think about the design of interactive systems to support discomfort, we can think about some things beforehand, during and after, and we can think about a few dimensions that will help us dial in our designs. KMC, that's it for me. Back to you. I, I, I just want to stop and think about that one for a while. That was brilliant, uh, Mike. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I hope okay. I can pull that in a bit here. Um, when I was making these slides, I wanted to put a big, and discomfort is also part of this continua to look at exactly what, what those three attributes were that Mike was talking about at the end of that part of the talk. So pretend we have some editing of these slides to do plainly. So what I'd like to do is, is, is slot this into again tuning and how we use these dimensionals for design. We talked about in Josh's talk, the N5 and C4, we said, you know, you can, can move on these. These are what we call continua. And the reason we are talking about continua, the dimensionality, if you will, is uh, instead of dichotomies or polarities, it's like it's not I'm, I've had food and or I'm hungry, so I'm sated or I'm hungry. There, there are movements between these and depending on what's going on, they might be moving back and forth quite quickly or they might stay in one place for a while and that's okay or it's not okay and it needs to be adjusted. So within a tuning design framework, the questions that we can start to ask explicitly, for instance, is, as Mike was asking, how do we accommodate this necessary component towards positive adaptation towards the aspiration you seek? How do we stick the landing of discomfort? We're working with some folks right now on strength training who've never done strength training before and helping them to anticipate and mitigate as much as possible the intensity of the delayed onset muscle soreness that they're bound to feel from doing repetitions of new joint movements. It's unavoidable, but how can we help them ready themselves? And does that readiness is a question we're asking. If we help them prepare for the discomfort, does that help them feel okay to stick with it? When they're unprepared, we see people run away from gyms like crazy because why would they want to hurt themselves and cause pain? 
So a couple of the, the I'm just going to quickly highlight some of the continuum that we use. And again, in the spring, we're going to be coming back to the design framework a lot more in preparation for our, our whole Kai workshop. Uh, but some of the things we can think about and some of our, our favorite right now that we're exploring a lot uh, uh, in the continuous space is uh, as this one, for instance, ownership, insourcing to outsourcing of knowledge, skills and practice. Where does that happen? For instance, on the left, we have the COVID famous Peloton bike and guided personal, not so personal training in which all you have to do to, to do this cardio workout is have an expensive bike that picks up your data and where you follow an instructor and pedal like mad or not so much based on what the instructor is doing. We talk about that as outsourcing the knowledge, skills, and practice necessary to get fit in a cardio way, do some movement. And again, just as Mike said, it's not good or bad in terms of the adaptation necessarily. It's, it's just what it is and sometimes that outsourcing of fitness help to another person, if it means this is how you're gonna to start to do it, is fantastic. If it means what do I do when I have no bike, I have no knowledge, skills, or practice about how I can get the same or better benefits without the Peloton bike and instructor, then you've hit the wall of where that experience is useful. But it can be, it's just ask this question in your designs. Am I designing more towards the outsourcing than the insourcing, or if we look at down here, we've got time, phases and cycles. Maybe it's really important to have a complete hand holding, tell you what to do for this part of the experience, but we're gonna taper that off towards greater and greater independence. So that's uh, a, a way that we can deliberately situate that question in our design, which is often just left off the table. You know, what, what's the exit cycle for a Fitbit that's a step counter? You know, when you put it in the washing machine, who knows? Also, uh, I'm going to skip a few of these, but the one here that I'm showing also here is, is the notion of state, of raw to cyborg. There's a lot of stuff going on in augmented humans, et cetera, that suggests, well, we're going to enhance the human by... Uh, putting extra appendages on or augmenting, for instance, in VR, there's a whole lot about augmenting perceptual experiences. And that can be great for entertainment. Why not? Uh, and the, the images that I've got here are of RoboCop, which was mostly cyborg artificial systems meshing with uh, human organic systems versus Bear Grylls, a UK survivalist who you can put him naked with a toothbrush somewhere and he can get out because he has in this other point here about practice, heuristics versus habit. For instance, we talked at the beginning about the person with the alarm clock has this dysfunctional practice that's been habituated. This is just what normal is. I hit the alarm clock. I set it and I hit it every morning, get up feeling kind of groggy, may crawl and brush my teeth or have a coffee or whatever the ritual that's been habituated is versus the Bear Grylls approach, which might be also useful in two cases here, of, of having heuristics. Bear Grylls to survive anywhere has a heuristic or rule of thumb or a template that says uh, protein, water, shelter. Pro, no, protein, shelter, water in that order. Isn't that interesting? That's the order. So, so that's a fantastic template guaranteed to help you survive. But you need there in that case knowledge and perhaps some practice around how to identify a protein in a different context. If you're in the tundra, it's gonna be different than what it is in the jungle and different jungles might have different proteins as well. So it's great to have the template, but you have to instantiate it. If you have the habit, everything is made explicit, exactly what to do, what time, where, how to do it. So those are the differences and, and the trade-offs between those two, but you can think about that deliberately. Am I trying to help this person build up a repertoire of heuristics that they can instantiate over time in different contexts? Or am I just trying to settle in a frickin' habit, like just brush your teeth, damn it. And you don't wanna have to think about it cognitively. So also to think about is something, do you want it to be very passive done for us and to us, or do we want the person to be really actively engaged with a particular practice? Is the dose, and again, uh, Mike was mentioning about how long do you wanna feel the discomfort for? Well. That can be part of deliberate design too. When is it intense? When is it light? And that might have to do with some of those other dimensions, like how experienced is a person? If I'm working with somebody who I can look at and know is a completely buff power lifter, 
I know that they know how to suck it up and I can push them into more of an endurance place with certain practices or similarly with an ultra runner than I would with somebody who's just starting to think about running a 5k maybe who's um, not been doing that for a very long time. So all I think we're suggesting in this is that we try to make the dimensions as explicit as possible. And we do have a design framework that's pointed to on the website in the in the primer. And some of the questions that we'd be asking is really about what's the adaptation you seek? And we can explore that in terms of aspirations based on the N5. We don't have to look beyond those spaces to support any aspiration. Our first approach experiment testing this back in 2014, I think, was working with creatives at an advertising agency who wanted to be more creative. And we said, well, let's let's improve all of those in five that you've got going. See, maybe they're fantastic right now, but we bet we could do some improvements. And we bet that if you do standardized testings around creativity, that you will see an improvement over each of these uh, in five that you explore and develop. And yeah, we did. And that's part of a, a, a paper that we have. Uh, George Morrison's on the call. He's one of the authors. Eric Heckler is one of the authors on that paper. It's called Experiment in the Box. So the design framework here is really about uh, how do we ask these questions? How do we make these uh, variables, these continua and these materials like discomfort simply explicit in the design space, how do we use N5 and C4 to make sure that those design choices are aligned with the dimensions that we know of absolutely 100% will affect the quality of alignment towards those positive or sought adaptations? And so we can use these questions like adaptation you seek, what are the values that you're looking for? How would you evaluate success and then how can you use these components of the continuum of this insourced, outsourced for how long heuristic versus habit raw cyborg uh, level of discomfort? And so that's that's really um, bringing it together. So to sum, sum up here is that what you've got today that you didn't have before is this yet another review, uh, again, of the N5C4. You'll be singing Meeks and Gamble in your sleep, I hope, real soon. We've introduced this tuning model about aligning adaptations with positive adaptations. We've looked at some strategies that Mike's presented, uh, I, I'm gonna be returning to them for sure, in terms of how to use actually and think about discomfort as a material to support positive adaptation. And you might say, and, and uh, you know, you don't all, for instance, when you're doing muscle training, you don't always feel delayed onset muscle source. There's not always, uh, that kind of discomfort. But believe me, if you're working at a certain intensity and you, you're breathing hard, you might enjoy it, but that might be because you're getting used to a certain level of intensity that has positive value for you. But it's not necessarily the most comfortable place in the world. Or if you're learning or exploring a new problem that feels challenging, it's like, oh, this is so hard, but it, it I, I'm going to crack it. Or you're working on something for days and it feels like it's never going to break open for you. And then it does. And why does it? It's it's because you've put those cycles in that are stretching us in new places. It's like you just, and this is what we're going to see with Brad Warner on the last talk, is you just cannot get to that place, that other side of the mountain. And again but it wouldn't be with what you needed to, to do it yourself. And if that's what you want, that's gonna be a challenge. And that's why I've got this old radio in here because we talk about tuning and there's so many frequencies to tune to. And the one thing that we didn't talk about is that Michael, I think kind of implied it in the discomfort in a, a social context or political context. Uh, and the social media thing was great is that sometimes we don't want to resonate with the dominant frequency in a group. If we're at a, at a group that is expressing views that are antithetical to us, we might not want to get in, in harmony with that. But on the other hand, the question was coming up for me about well, what, what makes social media so attractive if it's so um, awful in so many other ways is that it reflects us, it is comfortable. We, <laughs> we go there to feel comfortable either in shouting at somebody else or picking on somebody else or in hearing our own views reflected back to us. It's not a space where we, and this could be a very cool design. What if we designed a place that was deliberately discomfortable in terms of the voices that we hear, but somehow it's safe 
to listen and, and we can just be there with our discomfort for a while until we can kind of find a peaceful resonance. Doesn't mean we agree with somebody, but where we can find uh, understanding. Who knows? Maybe that's a new social media that will be grossly unsuccessful because it's discomfortable. But if we can start to model, well, what happens if you go through that process and you can start to see other people like human beings? Maybe it's not so bad. I, I don't know if I'll ever see billionaires quite that way. Um, but, that, you know, that's my problem, I guess. Uh, so so that's what I'm thinking about the resonances there. Anyway, thank you again for being with us. Oh, yeah, this this, this right? Oh, yes. Um, I, <laughs> many years ago, you know, the gym world used to say no pain, no gain. And uh, a dancer, contemporary dancer buddy of mine said, well, you know, no pain, no pain. And that might just be a really good place to be. So coming up in our seminary series is definitely no pain, a lot of fun. Is our next one, Olga and uh, Guillaume are going to be talking about uh, micro-randomized control trials and how we can do micro-randomization inside trials to look at time series data and understand things in way cool and new and exciting ways. And uh, then we have Ryan Andrews coming up talking about the food chain. Dana Lewis is going to be talking about DIYing pancre pancreases, which is really incredible, and the trouble that she got into, well, I shouldn't say trouble that she got into, but the resistance dialogue of discomfort there, and we'll cap off the series with, for this year, for this term, with Brad Warner, punk Zen monk, um, talking more about discomfort. So we've, we've kind of gone over the time we thought we'd be here, but if any of y'all have questions, we can carry on in the Slack, but if there's some observations or comments or anything you'd like to share before we close up, um, on this one, uh, let's let's uh, let's see. It'd be lovely to hear some some voices uh, from the folks in the house. So, anybody want to turn on their camera, ask a question, share a thought, anything? Mike, you want to turn on your camera just to come back in for the final bow here? Hi, Lindsay. <laughs> Uh, just uh, wanted to, I, I think uh, uh, just one quick uh, uh, comment uh, that I might have is basically about um, reward, uh, the role of reward in all of these things, uh, because mm -hmm. uh, as Mike said, uh, uh, so um, designing for discomfort is one way to look at it, but uh, um, are we also designing to make uh, discomfort bearable by providing some sort of reward there or um, uh, how do you uh, think that what is the role of reward in all this? I think you were talking about that Mike in terms of connecting people back with their purpose or their aspiration. Do you want to go for that one? Yeah, no, great question and I didn't catch who asked that question. That was Indu, I believe. Oh, Indu. Yeah, great. Nice to meet you. I think I saw you mentioned some things similar on Slack. So in terms of reward, um, I think I'm, I'm still thinking about it, but I think I come at reward from maybe a different perspective than you are. So I'm interested in seeing what you think of this, but I think of the reward as um, arising naturally or organically might be a good word from the discomfort itself. So. Um, in the framework I've presented, I think of the reward as something that um, is produced by experiencing the discomfort, and the idea is to help the person see the reward. So to return to running, which is a nice concrete example, the, the reward is intrinsic to the activity, right? So uh, the reward for running is how you feel afterwards, how you feel when you can reach an aspiration. So it's always connecting to something that's intrinsic to the experience. But I, I wonder if you think of it a bit more externally, a bit more something that's brought in. But I'm anyway, I'm curious that those are my thoughts, but I'm curious what your thoughts. Are. Yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah, I guess um, reward can be both internal and external. Um, so I think what I'm uh, wondering about is basically the external reward. Like, let's say if we stick to running, uh, one thing is, of course, we are going to feel good physically and we will be seeing improvements in health and strength and all these things. But also probably uh, uh, people will appreciate 
how you look and that sort like you'll get good compliments probably that's another reward that people look for um more than any i mean sometimes the driving factors can be external the reward can be external yeah that's so yeah yeah that that's really interesting and do that um i think i think you're right and i think uh what it made me think of was perhaps um what i might call the difference between an incentive and a reward so uh for me uh and i think other people i'm much more likely to show up early in the morning to go running if i know that somebody else is going to be there waiting for me right so there's also this idea of an external and, and i think for many people uh incentives would be external right and so the reward so I'm, maybe a reward comes after and an incentive comes before and there's like an external internality split there anyway go ahead no oh, yeah i agree i agree um um yeah um so um uh, probably i'm just using another terminology for perceived feeling as mc said um yeah um but um yeah uh, so, so I was thinking more in terms of uh, reward motivation, um, more neuroscientific model. Yeah. Which if, would be, if, if, go sorry, ahead. Go ahead Mark. No, I was going to well, say that's completely over my head. So I'm curious to hear <laughs> more about well, that. If, if you think about it from the neurologic perspective, yes, we do have motivational uh, air, uh, or areas aligned with motivation in the brain and 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 reward both negative and positive reinforcement but again what what we've also seen and what the cognitive psychology literature seems to suggest so far around that is this is this is why checking in with somebody to find out well what what is your motivator what what would make you get out as mike says out of bed in the morning what would make you sit here what do you need to have at this point in your life to go through what i'm about to tell you for instance as a coach working with a lot of people this is what it's going to take to get from where you are now to where you want to be. And of course, there's, there's um, again, in the knowledge, skills and practice space, I mean, this gets really interesting and complicated because where somebody wants to be, if I open up a book and say, which body type are you trying to go for if you're coming in because you want to feel better about how you look and you want other people to respond to you physically more positively, and you point out a physique, that you know is going to take three years to get to, and and you and say, okay, this is a, we're, are we up for a three year plan, or would you like to look at the phases in between in terms of the temporal cycle, um, that that might change the dialogue. So in other words, I guess what I'd say, Indu, is that it's really valuable to find out what somebody thinks that they want to understand how far away they are from from there right now to be able to create a, pro, a, a picture of what that would take for that person and to see if that's still what they want, given that's the price. Yeah, yeah, sure. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> OK, uh, I think this is great signs of conversations that, that can be carried on and also to help unify concepts like you said from from the neuro side of the house to the sports performance side of the house and and to find out what we're designing for and and what we need to know i guess is another thing as designers we quite often think okay well let's let's do something for weight loss um, without thinking that most people don't want to just gain or lose weight some guys want to gain weight for muscle some gals and guys want to lose weight to to look more lean um, but it's not just that, is it? That they, they also there's usually also a desire for some kind of particular body composition that comes along with that. So, are we talking just about weight loss? Or are we talking about uh, other things? And how do we articulate that? And as Mike pointed out, help somebody um, suck up the discomfort between that. Ryan Andrews, who's coming up uh, in two weeks' time. One of the best charts I've seen in a long time is, is he's done an awful lot of work clinically with people around getting leaner. And he has a fabulous, I'll find the link for it, of what it takes to get to different levels of body fat percentage. And in terms of what you you can eat, what you mostly can't eat, and for how long. And what's fabulous about that is that it, like, it makes it really black and white. If this is where you want to be, you have to ask yourself, are you prepared 
to do what it takes today to get there? Or do you maybe want to just start here, which might be a little easier on your body and your nervous system and your motivation centers? I'm talking way too much. I apologize. You guys are all sitting around here. Is there anything else, any comment anybody else would like to, to leave for posterity before we wrap for tonight, today, whatever time of day it is when you're watching this? Okay, well, seeing nothing right now, I hope you'll come on to Slack, keep the conversation going. Let us know if we're heading in a good direction for, for uh, creating dialogue. Um, and I hope you had a good time tonight. You have a good time so far? Mike and I probably had a good time. I hope you guys had a good time. Thumbs yeah, up. Thanks for putting going that this. together. And really enjoyed yeah. the conversation and questions and opportunity to talk. Yep. I yep. okay. So talk to y'all uh, soon. Please come next week. The talks with Gimon and thank you very much, Dushani. The talks with Gimon and Olga are really freaking bleeding edge that HCI types have not seen, but we can definitely benefit from and embrace. So I hope you'll come for some new methods starting next week uh, and check the calendar for the right time zone. Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording and stop the meeting and uh,